is one of my favorite sections in the entirety of Scripture. Uh, so if you get drowsy, I might get very excited today and wake you up at times of time, and uh, I don't apologize for that. <laughs> Do you need encouragement today? It seems like the world that we live in is out of control, or maybe when it seems like your life is out of control. What you need in those times is encouragement that only God can provide to you. And maybe you can look back at your life and, and notice that maybe there was a season where it was really dark and it was difficult times and at just the right time, a Christian brother or sister gave you just the right words to get you through it. Maybe it came in the form of a letter that you didn't expect or a phone call or even a text message. The message was simple, but it said basically this, you're going to make it through it. God is in control. The beauty of Daniel chapter 7 is it gives us a clear picture of reality as it actually is. And when we see that picture, we see God on his throne, ruling all things. Daniel 7 came in a, in a period in the Babylonian history that was very dark. You see, when we hit Daniel 7, we're actually taken back in time to the days of Belshazzar. Belshazzar was a young, inexperienced, brash, party animal, and godless king. He treated both God and his people with contempt. During those days, the people of God felt the weightiness of that oppression on them. And along comes the vision of God in Daniel 7. It's designed to give God's people hope. It's designed to take them up into the heavens as it were. And to show them reality as it actually is versus down here where we live and move. As we enter into Daniel 7, we're also entering into a different type of literature. You see, Daniel 1 through 6 is historical narrative. It talks about Daniel and his friends living in Babylon, going through the miseries of that life. Daniel 7 is a little bit different. Beginning in Daniel 7, we move from narrative to visionary literature. We move from something that is, let's say, concrete to visionary and symbolic. Daniel 7 through 12. This type of literature is given a title. It's apocalyptic. It tends to be very visionary, very graphic. And the reason for this is because this type of literature is designed to combat a very graphic world of idolatry. And so the good news in Daniel 7 is that we are going to have a chance to look at the way things actually are. It's going to jolt us up out of this world. And I believe Daniel 7 is one of the most encouraging chapters in the whole of, his, of Scripture. It's important that we look at life on, at, from the vantage point of God's throne and not from the vantage point of just this earth. The book of Revelation, John over and over gives people a label. The label is an earth dweller. An earth dweller is a type of person, they're non-believers, and all they can see and experience and taste and touch is this world, and that is where their ultimate hope is. Earth dwellers are idolaters to their core. And it's tempting for each one of us to be like that, isn't it? To kind of view life only down here. To love this world, this fallen world. Daniel is going to communicate very clearly and graphically to those who are going through times of trouble. 
to those who are experiencing the full gambit of the difficulties of the human experience. Whether that be physical illness or pain, psychological hostilities, bodily trials, or simply just the problems of living in a fallen world. Daniel 7 through 12 is going to shock us into seeing things the way they really are, not the way that they seem to be. Friends, the good news, and we've got to be reminded of this all the time, this world is not your ultimate home. The goals of this world, those are not ultimate. God's kingdom is ultimate. So the point, we'll start with it and then we'll begin to dive through the chapter, is this. God rules history. And God's kingdom will never be destroyed. We're going to do two things today. We'll divide the scripture in half. We're going to look, first of all, Daniel 7, 1 through 8. We'll call that life on this earth. Daniel's going to clearly tell us what life on this earth looks like, both for those in Babylonian captivity and also in our experience right now. And then we'll look secondly at God's throne room, verses 9 through 14. As we look at Daniel 7, verses 1 through 8, I'm going to read it like this. I'll read verse 1. We'll talk about it. And then I'll look at verses 2 through 8, and we'll talk about those as a whole. Read with me in your Bibles, Daniel 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Pause there. Do you notice what's happening from Daniel 6 to Daniel 7? Daniel 6, we learned about Darius. Actually, we learned about him at the end of Daniel 5. Remember that? Belshazzar, this young Babylonian king, was partying it up. And outside of Babylon marched the great Persian army. And at the end of Daniel 5, Babylon falls to the Persian ruler Darius, probably also known as Cyrus the Great. It's Daniel 5, the end of it. Daniel 6 tells us about what happens during the reign of Cyrus. And then we get to Daniel 7, and look at what we're doing. We're no longer moving chronologically forward in history. Babylon, Persia. Now we go back, as it were, to the days when the Babylonian king Belshazzar was ruling. That's important. It's important because you need to realize that books like Daniel don't necessarily progress chronologically through time. They move back and forth, as it were. Daniel 7, as a whole, will have two parts. We're going to look at part 1 today, verses 1 through 14. This is the vision. Daniel 7, verses 15 through 28 will be the interpretation. We'll look at that next week. Continue to read. Verses 2 through 8 now. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the four great beasts came out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then I looked, then as I looked, its, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. Behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions. And behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up 
by the roots. Behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. The setting of the dream is by the great sea. Or we could say it like this, the beast that Daniel sees, they arise out of the sea. In the ancient world, both in the Bible and then you know, other broader cultures, the ancient peoples believed that the sea was the personification of evil. Now, I know West Texas is a long way away from the ocean. However, if we lived on the coast during the experience of a hurricane, what would you say about the sea? You might say something like this. The sea destroys everything that we work hard for. The sea takes away our future. The sea is violent. Psalm 89, verses 8 through 10, pictures the sea like this. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crush Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The sea is the personification of evil. But God rules even over the sea. It's interesting that the beast that Daniel describes, they come from the sea. Now again, if the sea is a personification of evil, then things that come out of that must also be evil. Daniel pictures four beasts. We're going to learn later that these four beasts are representative of four kingdoms. Have we heard something like this before in the book of Daniel? Yes. Do you remember Daniel chapter 2? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He dreamed of this great statue composed of four different types of metal. And that statue represented, Daniel told us, four different kingdoms. Well, here we see four beasts, probably representative, again, of four different kingdoms. Daniel 2 is a theology of history. Its message was really simple, basically this. There are the kingdoms of the world. They believe that they're immovable, that they will last forever. And yet, at the same time, God's kingdom arises. It looks small and insignificant, a stone, but it grows and grows until it becomes a great mountain that crushes and pieces and destroys the kingdoms of the world. The first beast that Daniel saw in chapter 7 looks like a lion with eagle's wings. It stands on its feet like a man. Now, interpreters have argued, and probably correctly, that this first beast looks a lot like Nebuchadnezzar. Remember Daniel chapter 4. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He boasted, you know, Lo, look at Babylon. Look at everything that I've done. You know, I am the man. And then God humbles him. He sends him out in the pasture, and he eats grass like an ox until he's completely humbled by God. So the first beast is more than likely the kingdom of Babylon. The second beast looks like a bear, and it's in the process of devouring a meal. The second beast, commentators have argued, and I would generally agree, the second beast is probably the Medio Persia Empire. Third beast looks like a leopard with the wings of a bird and it has four heads. Now, again, interpreters have argued, and, and I would agree, that this is probably the kingdom of Greece. Brought up by Alexander the Great, yet Alexander dies, and his kingdom is spread to four generals. You know, ultimately, out of those four generals will come one who is a very evil person, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. Fourth kingdom is probably Rome. Daniel is picturing kingdoms in a beastly fashion. 
I think this is important. I want to ask you a related question. What is the role of government? I know we're in an election year. And so we're thinking about these things a lot. You know, moving from one official to another. The role of government in general. What is the purpose of government? You know, we can philosophize on that. But I would argue historically, the government's sole function is to protect its people. That's it. What happens when a government that is designed to protect its people actually turns on its own people and devours them? What would we call that government? Yeah, let's put it differently. Let's say you had a dog. You buy this dog because you've got chickens, and uh, the dog is supposed to protect the chickens from raccoons and foxes and you know, every other thing that wants to eat a chicken. And you come home one day, and you look in your yard, and man, there's chicken feathers scattered everywhere. And you see your best friend, the dog, and he is covered in blood. What would you say about that dog? You are no longer a protector. You're a beast. You need to be put down. The kingdoms of the world, by and large, have been hostile to believers. Now we can see this both in the Old Testament world, again, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and you can look at our world as well. It doesn't take long for a political entity, if it is you know, somewhat peaceable toward Christians, to move and shift in a direction where it just doesn't like Christianity that much. Nations tend to be beastly. That is what they do. The state tends to be godless. It tends to devolve, if you will, not evil. So Daniel is giving us a picture in verses 1 through 8 of life on this earth. What does it look like? Life on this earth looks like this. It looks like believers are getting beat up day after day after day by a godless state. And it doesn't matter which state that is. It could be Babylon. It could be Persia. It could be Rome. It could be any other kingdom in the history of the world. What do they do to God's people? They are hard on God's people. And what is the experience of God's people in that world? Answer, life is really hard in that world. And we are tempted to think that is all that there is. At this point, we have to pause. We have to see reality from a different perspective. Verses 9 through 14 picture God's throne room. What we're going to do is we're going to break this down. I'm going to read verses 7 through 12. We'll pause, and then we'll read verses 13 and 14. Uh, Verses 9 through 12. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Notice how swiftly Daniel's vision moves from this world in its painful agony up into the throne room of God. Notice how swiftly as well the kingdoms of the world, they fall apart and God is the only one standing. The focus of Daniel's 7, 9 through 14 is on what is truly immovable, what is truly eternal, 
what is truly unshakable. The heavenly scene will picture two persons and their relationship to the throne. The first person is given a title, the Ancient of Days. This is verse 9. This is a description of God the Father ruling on his throne. Notice this title again. God is the Ancient of Days. Now, he's not given this title because he is a frail and dementia-laden politician. You know, I know age is coming up a lot in the political cycle, you know. What is the right age to rule the world? Well, God is the Ancient of Days, but he's not given that title because he's frail, because he's weak or forgetful. God has given that title because he has no beginning. He has no ending. He alone is the Ancient of Days. He has always existed. He is infinitely wise. Isaiah 41 verse 4 says this, I the Lord, the first and with the last, I am He. In the ancient world and our world, age and wisdom go together. Is there anyone more wise than God? No. God is further described as having his clothing being white as snow. I think this points more than likely to his ethical purity or perhaps to the brightness of his presence. Anytime in Scripture when God shows up, what, what do the people see? Well, they don't see God as he is, but they see bright, radiant light. Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with, spin, with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. God is on his throne. We also see with the Lord on his throne, we see flames of fire. Exodus 3.14, when God shows up, Moses doesn't expect to find God, but Moses is walking in the desert and he sees a bush that is on fire and yet not fully consumed. When God is made visible in Scripture, fire accompanies him. And in verse 10, we realize that this fire also is representative of divine judgment. God is on the throne and the books are opened. Now, this is the way it's going to work as well at the end of time. When Christ returns, when he raises the dead, gives them their glorified resurrection bodies, judgment happens as well at that time. And this is a picture of that judgment. I want you to notice that there are two sets of books. There are books plural. And if God reads from the books in relationship to you, that is not good news. The books have in them the deeds of humanity, the things that we have done. There's another book as well that we'll see in this picture, and that is the book singular, the Lamb's Book of Life. Here's how judgment works. If you are a non-believer, you don't believe in Christ, then you are judged based upon what you have done, your works. And the result of that is what? We all know. Romans 3, 22 and 23. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. On your works alone, what do you get? You don't get heaven. You get the opposite. There's another book, and that is the Lamb's Book of Life. The Day of Judgment. If God reads from the Lamb's Book of Life in relationship to you, there are names written in it. Your name is written in it because of Christ's work. In other words, one group is judged based on their works. Another group is judged based on Christ's work. And if you're judged based on Christ's work, 
the result is glory for you. Heaven for you. What we're seeing is a gospel picture here in this judgment scene. God has come to bring life. But the way that he's going to give that life is not based on the things that we do. It's based on another. It's based on Christ's work. Now notice in verses 11 and 12, the judgments that we see on an individual realm in verse 10 is now played out on a larger scale. What about the nations of the earth? Well, the answer is they're going to be judged as well. Let's move into verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. The identity of the Son of Man is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you three reasons why I would hold that view. First of all, notice that the Son of Man comes riding on the clouds. If you were to look up that concept in the Old Testament, you're going to find out only God rides clouds. That's it, period. So think about this. You have God, the Ancient of Days. He's sitting on his throne. And then God comes to meet with God. In my view, if you're a Jew reading this, you should figure out, huh, God is Father and God is Son of Man. It's there in the Old Testament. Second, the Greek version of Daniel 7 has the Son of Man coming, notice this, as the Ancient of Days. So in other words, the Son comes as God. Why? Because He is God. Third, what's the best place to go to understand the phrase Son of Man? Go to the Gospels. You know, Jesus, Jesus will use the title Son of Man for himself over 80 times. And he'll use it in a variety of ways. He'll use the phrase Son of Man to describe his ministry in its humiliation and his ministry in its exaltation. Humiliation, Matthew 8, 20. Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, for many. So what is Son of Man coming to do? To suffer on this earth. To die as a ransom for many. Mark 14, 62 gives the other side of the Son of Man. Jesus says, I am and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. In other words, the Son of Man will go through suffering now. He will be vindicated, and he will come again in glory. It's important for us to notice the ministry of the Son of Man. Why? Why? His ministry is going to look like your life on this earth. Let me say it differently. Christ's life is the paradigm. That's the pattern. So the pattern looks like this. Living down here as it is is going to be tough. But that's not all that there is. What really matters is up here, God's kingdom in his glory. You have to experience this before you can experience this. The 
times get tough for the people of God, you have to realize God is on his, his throne and things are not the way that they appear down here. It's a good story uh, told by Sinclair Ferguson. I'll repeat it to you. He tells the story of a missionary that was returning home. He had labored over in a foreign land. This was back in the days when uh, international travel was done by boat, not by plane. The boat that he was riding back on, there happened to be a famous dignitary on the same ship. And when the ship came into New York Harbor, there were scores of people that were cheering and shouting and yelling and welcoming home this dignitary, this state official. The missionary, as he peers through the crowd of revelers, he does not see a familiar face in the entire crowd. And there, in a moment of self-pity, he began to think, I, I poured out my life sharing the gospel, and no one is here to welcome me home. And as those thoughts danced in his head, something else came to mind. And it was as if a voice from heaven spoke to him and said this, Do not be discouraged. You have not reached your home yet. Friends, contrary to the appearances of this world and of human history, God rules. God is on his throne. Take heart. Things are not what they appear at the present time. It's the first Sunday of the month. And as you know, the first Sunday of the month is Lord's Supper Sunday. As I read in 1 Corinthians 11, the institution of the Lord's Supper... I think what you're going to hear in this text is the ministry of the Son of Man. His life, His death, His resurrection, and His second coming. When we join together to take the elements, what we're doing is we are celebrating Christ's work. We're celebrating the fact that this world is not all that there is. That Christ has come to deliver us from the world. We celebrate the fact that he's coming again. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. As our elders come down to hand out the trays, you're going give to be given some time to examine your own, your own life, your own heart. And possibly during this time today, you, you might think about your situation in this world. Maybe life has been really hard, and you've been questioning, yeah, God, why? Why am I going through this? Well, during this time, you're going to get a chance to examine the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And I think as we do that, this world's going to make sense to you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the Son of Man. You are the, you are the suffering servant and the conquering King. Lord, as we gather around your table, we are celebrating that reality. And Lord, we pray that you would apply this to us as we eat of the bread and drink of the fruit of the, of the vine. We thank you, O Son of Man, 
for conquering death. We thank you, Son of Man, that you will come again in glory. We pray this in the name of our God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen.